This is Bible Academy. We're in the book of Galatians. <clears throat> now before we get started, we need to make sure that we have confessed our sins, that we are controlled by the Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege, the opportunity that we have to study your word. We ask that we'll have open hearts and minds to your truth today. In Jesus' name, amen. We are in Galatians chapter 5, studying one of the most important subjects when it comes to our walk with Jesus. When it comes to our Christian life and empowerment that we get from the Spirit of God. Galatians 5.16 begins this topic. Let's go back to that point and then we'll continue where we left off last time. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh strongly desires against the Spirit and the spirit strongly desires against the flesh. For these are opposing one another, so that you may not do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious, which are sexual immorality, impurity, depravity, idolatry, sorcery, hostilities, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish rivalries, dissensions, factions, and the list continues. But we had left off with sorcery. We we're just about to look at sorcery. Uh, idolatry, in verse 20, is worship of a creature rather than cre the creator. Now as we move into the word sorcery. I think I said when we left off last time that's an interesting word because of the implications and the way it is applied today. The word in the Greek, I'm going to put it up as well as some definitions and an explanation. Pharmakeia. Of course you see the word pharmacy from that, or pharmaceutical. It does have to do with drugs. In sorcery, in the practice of sorcery, drugs were used as potions as well as poisons in that practice. With witchcraft, it was used for the casting of spells. Also with sorcery for the inducement of trances. So people would go into their trances when they went into these temples they would take their drugs, as we'd use the term today, and they would have experiences, uh, go into trances and have sorts of visions, not much different than trips people have nowadays. But the idea of pharmakeia includes the dabbling in and a direct involvement with evil forces. In the ancient world, it was the demonic activity behind the idol worship, it's not much different today, demonic activity behind all sorts of drug activity and the uh, debauchery that goes on with that. But one of the things I want you to understand is one of the easiest ways to get involved in demonic influence, demonic activity, and for unbelievers even to become possessed by demons is to get in drugs. Get into drugs. Give yourself over to the drug and then give yourself over to demonic activity which can lead to possession. So it is a dangerous activity to dabble in. I have nothing to do with it. During the tribulation I want to read a verse 
from Revelation on sorceries. And they did not repent of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their immorality, nor of their thefts. So we can expect rampant drug activity during the time of the Antichrist and the Tribulation. It wouldn't surprise me if drugs, illegal, what we call illegal drugs today, would be promoted within the Tribulation with some sort of uh, propaganda line that has to do with demons and powers and that type of thing. In other words, a good picture of it would be painted as well as immorality and murdering those who don't belong, that type of thing. Well, that covers idolatry and sorcery. Some people relate both of those to religious activities, which I can understand that. The next sins mentioned that come from the flesh have to do with relationships with other human beings, social relations. Of course, these are all in the negative sense. The word is hostilities. It's in the plural. Meaning there's more than one, of course, but you don't always get that with some of these words. But there is hostilities present that are produced from the sinful nature. The word ekthra E-C-H-T-H-R-A, does mean hostility, enmity, being an enemy of someone. Basically, it is doing hateful acts. And we would see that towards other classes of people, uh, races of people. Uh, whatever reason, someone felt that they had a reason to hate somebody. You didn't need much excuse if you didn't go along with their religion, their way of life, their viewpoint. One who is ruled by the sin nature can easily begin to resent, and that leads to hate towards individuals or groups. Another sin stemming from the flesh towards people is strife. The word here is eris, E-R-I-S. It does mean strife or contention. It includes rivalries. I want to expand on some of these meanings. We, we need to do that just as we will on the uh, positive side, the positive fruit that come from the spirit. I just don't want to run through these terms and not us give us some serious thought to what they mean and what's really going on with somebody because let me explain when you get these terms down and understand how they connect to each other and of course the root and then we'll see the outward activity of some of these things it helps you figure out people and situations why people are the way they are sometimes there's some deep-seated hate and resentment that leads to these outward acts of strife and contention. The results from ekthra, the hatefulness, look at Romans 13.13. 13. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension, the word there is also the same for strife and jealousy. Now Paul gives within his epistles several of these lists of the worst fleshly acts. And that's true on the other side too. He'll give several lists of the fruit of the Spirit. But we see they're often connected together because in these circles of people who do this, these things are common. You see the arguments and the fights along with the drunkenness and the sexual immorality and then there's the jealousy and, and it goes on and on. And we don't have to be told about that if we've lived very long on this earth. Another outward manifestation of the hatefulness of the ekthra, the hateful attitude, is jealousy. 
Just plain jealousy in the singular here. Zealous. We usually speak the term zealous. Now, zealous is one of those words that gets kind of confusing because it has both a negative and a positive side to it. In the negative sense, we have envy, jealousy, and we know jealousy leads to all sorts of wrongful activity. Uh, on the positive side, uh, you have God zealous for his people. Or we can be zealous for God. Or you can be zealous for your job or something else, you see. But here in this context, it is negative. So it is intense negative feelings over another's success or achievements, his possessions, his status, maybe his attachments, whether it be his job or his family, or he has a nice clean-cut family and people get jealous of that and want to malign them or attack them. And this can lead to sins also. Uh, negative zealousness or jealousy can result in the next one on the list. Outburst of anger. That's in the plural. It also will lead to the next three after that. Selfish rivalries, dissensions, factions. Let's take them one at a time. Outburst of anger in the plural. The word is thumos. You see the word tumultuous. Thumos. Passion in anger. This one too has a positive or negative definition. You can have passion for good things. You can have a passion for God. A passion to, to do the right thing. Perhaps a passion for your spiritual gift. But there's also the negative, and that's what we have here. And we get such terms as indignant. The thing about passion is, is that it comes and goes. As I described here, anger that rises, then settles, then rises like temper flare-ups. You know, this person may have what they call a short fuse. X 19.28 reads, X 19.28. Uh, when they heard this and were filled with rage, there's your word, Thumas, they began crying out, saying, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. This is those people reacting to the apostles, or Paul. And they go in a rage. The next term on our list, Erethea, meaning selfish rivalries. Selfish rivalries. Factions sometimes translated in that sense, the desire to put oneself forward. And this is the problem with so many uh, competitive uh, organizations. It's easy to get into some of the selfishness and the competitiveness that becomes inordinate and sinful. And pretty soon you combine that with pride and then there's resentment and then people can get pretty ugly. And this is how you have group fights and factions within a company or even a church. We have to be real careful that when we have comp competition, whether it be in sport or something that seems quite innocent, that we're not getting into sinful type of activity. People are driven by pride and rivalries and as a Christian we have to approach that with some caution. The next term in the plural also dissensions. The Greek 
dikotasia, division. Um, this word can mean dissensions, as I've translated it, or discords, divisiveness, to cause divisions among groups. To cause division among groups. Now, keep in mind, this is what that sin nature will do. If we allow it to run its course, and if you were saved as an older person, I expect you may have let it run its course a few times. But of course, that can be true of a believer too. Uh, you see it in churches, dissensions and divisiveness. Uncalled for. In most every case I've seen, it's going to be completely uncalled for and motivated by sin. The next term is factions. As you can see, some of these words are similar, but this one has a little broader definition. It will look familiar as you see the transliteration from the Greek. This is the word for factions. It's Hyrasis. Hyrasis. And we get the term heresy from it. Two definitions here that are pertinent to our study. The first, a view that is off from the true Christian faith. It's outside of Bible doctrine. It's a heresy. It's not, it just isn't a difference of opinion on things like the tribulation or the rapture, uh, what goes on in the tribulation, I should say, or, or when it occurs. But we're talking about major doctrinal differences. Uh, someone who might deny the deity of Christ or the humanity of Christ or that there's a trinity or that the Bible is inspired. Those type of things are, are Bible doctrine that's orthodox truth. To go outside of those would be heresy. Now a second definition of this word, hierasis, hierasis, is a group or division based upon a different doctrinal viewpoint. So basically you take the people who hold to the heresy and they are part of a heresy group in the sense of a faction. Or it may be a different opinion but used in a negative sense, often translated as a sect or faction in the scripture. Now I wanted us to look at this a little closer because it is an important term. I haven't fully developed it as a doctrine yet, but it could be going that direction. Let's look at it a point at a time. The word sect, it's sometimes translated sect. We see that with regard to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were called a sect in the scripture, or they are called a sect in the scripture. Acts 5, 17 through 18 and 26, 5. However, two, Christians were called the way that were called the way, were labeled as a sect. Christians that were called the way were labeled as a sect. Acts 24, 14. Acts 24, 14. Point two is the term for heresies itself. Uh, the meaning heresy, as we saw in the first definition. Peter warns against heresy, 2 Peter 2.1. But there are also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, there's our word, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction 
on themselves. <clears throat> Point three, we look at the term when it's translated factions. One, Paul lists it as a work of the flesh. That's in our passage. Galatians 5, 19 and 20. Now the works of the flesh, one of those are factions. Two, however, there can be a good result of factions. 1 Corinthians 11.19. I didn't say factions were good, but there can be a good result. For there must be factions among you so that those who are approved may be evident among you. The factions often form are negative. They're not concerned about the group as a whole. They're concerned about their little faction. And when these factions begin to form, Others who stay outside these factions and don't have that kind of spirit, they are the ones who are doing the right thing generally. And that's what it means when it says those are approved. They become evident, those who don't join the factions, you see. Now let me make this clear. There are times that if a church turns to heresy, they get a teacher in there and people are completely uh, just crazy over this guy and they want to go hear him and he's just uh, he's very charismatic in the way he speaks and he moves people and they're crying and they're laughing and they're having a good old time. But he's teaching heresy. It may be time for you and those who know the word of God to start pointing these things out. Now you may be labeled as a faction. But don't let a term like this that's used in negative sense uh, intimidate you from doing the right thing. I think you know what I mean on this. Well, in verse 21, Paul continues to list more of these works of the flesh. The emphasis is on that they do come from the flesh, the old man, the sinful nature. Galatians 5.21 Envy And then I have murder in brackets. We'll discuss that in a few moments. Drunkenness Drinking parties And things like these of which things I warn you just as I have warned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. The word envy that's in the plural, but how do you say envyings? We don't usually use it that way, but to keep it better English, we just translate it in the singular. The word pathanos, it does mean envying. A state of ill will towards someone because of some real or presumed advantaged advantage experienced by such a person. A state of ill will towards someone because some real or presumed advantage experienced by such a person. You think that someone has something over you, you begin to envy them, envy them in whatever manner. It's similar to jealousy in some ways. You want what they got. You envy their position. You envy their uh, place where they live. Uh, they've got a beautiful automobile and yours hardly runs. Uh, you just don't want to get into sinful activity and envy somebody to the point of actually sinning. It's one thing to see something and say that's nice, I wish I had one, but when you get into the area of envying you are committing mental sins. The next term I mentioned was murder. It's in brackets. The reason for that is, is that there's a textual critical problem. And that stems from when you compare the manuscripts of the New Testament, some of the better ones disagree. In fact, in this one, this particular terms, it's absent from, from the 
from some of the best manuscripts. And so what the critics do, they go in and they examine the different manuscripts and try to figure out why the copyist did what he did. Why he added something, why he left something out, why he changed the letter. And sometimes they can see where he probably made his error. In this case, they think he repeated something perhaps that was in his mind or he thought should have been in there that some other copyist left out, having in mind Romans 129, for example, where we have these terms envying and murder together. So he just inserts them in here. But I put it in brackets with the note for you that this is probably not in the original. Now, we also know that murder does stem from fleshly activity. It's an extreme activity. But if it's not in the original, we do want to make note of that, and that's what we're doing. <clears throat> Another term is drunkenness. That's in the plural. Drunkenness. People getting drunk repeatedly is an act of the fleshly nature. I mean, one time is an act of the fleshly nature, but to continue to do it indicates that you're continuing in the flesh. The word is methe. Meth's a word for wine, one of them. Uh, intoxication. Drunkenness, that's what it means. Getting drunk is a manifestation of the sinful nature. No doubt about it. You've decided to let your mind go and give it over to an alcoholic beverage. One of the manifestations of the flesh. Along with that, and also in the plural, is drinking parties. I think most of the translations will use a term like carousing. I didn't like that term because I think people think carousing is men being the women. That's not always the case. The komos, the Greek word, means drinking parties. It can include orgies, carousing. But it was a term that was used during the drunken pagan festivals. Uh, as in the honor of the wine god Bacchus or some other deity with that honor by drinking and getting drunk. And you can imagine, just like today, people look forward to the Mardi Gras, or they look forward to some of the holidays as an opportunity to get drunk, or the weekend ball game. Uh, these lead to drinking parties, another manifestation of the flesh. <clears throat> and this leads to uh, in the ancient world, it led to the idol worship and a number of other sexual activities at times. Then Paul, at the end of this, says, And things like these. And things like these. Let's go back to our entire verse and read it together. Envying, drunkenness, drinking parties, and things like these which indicates there are more. He just didn't put them on the list. And then he says, things I warn you, present tense, I'm warning you right now. Just as I have warned you, past tense, I've warned you in the past. So he's going around again with them on this. And here's what he warns them. Listen to this that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now in a real sense, this is a strong warning. Because people who do this habitually are those who are not saved. The word for practice, present, active, participle, Proso, the present active participle means it continues on. It can be, it can be habitually practiced, periodically, periodically practiced, but it is continued in some form. The word proso means to accomplish, to practice, to do. Those who 
I would put it this way, who regularly do this, uh, who get drunk every weekend, who get drunk when they have the opportunity. That's the type of people we're talking about. No doubt that would include the alcoholics, uh, those who struggle with alcohol all the time. Uh, I understand that's an addiction. But at the same time, most people who just regularly get drunk are doing it out of sin. They do not inherit future active indicative clairo, clay, clairana, meo. Clairana, meo. It means inherit. And then a term or a phrase we should be familiar with the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. They do not inherit the kingdom of God. Now we've discussed this in a number of series. Very important, important phrase for the Christian. When you become a believer, in one sense, you enter the kingdom of God. You have the Holy Spirit. You have a place in heaven for you. You live in the power of the kingdom in the sense that you have the Spirit from heaven. Sent by Christ as promised from the Father. The kingdom of God includes the basic inheritance package. That means eternal life. You have the resurrection body if you've died. Otherwise, you get a transformed body. You live in the presence of Christ forever. Both in the millennial kingdom, when he sets up his kingdom here on earth, and then when that's all destroyed, the new heavens and the earth come down with Jerusalem, you'll be with him forever and eternity. That's a basic inheritance package. Every believer gets that. On top of that, if you serve faithfully, there is reward. On top of that, you've served in special ways faithfully. There is crowns. Now, let's look at this and understand one more thing. When it says those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, if we go back within Galatians in chapter 3, we learn about the inheritance regarding Abraham. Those of you in Galatia who think your inheritance line with Abraham, you won't get that either. You won't get the spiritual inheritance that's coming to him. So in one sense, this is addressed in a special way to the believing Jews. The idea here is that those who continuously do the things we've just listed in the flesh, and there's a lot more, Paul didn't list them all, they do not inherit God's kingdom. They're not believers. Now, this is not saying that a believer who has a temporary lapse into one or more of these sins loses his salvation all of a sudden. That's not the way it works. We are secure in Christ. There are a couple of ways in which one can free himself from Christ and become an unbeliever. One is apostasy. The other one is to get caught up in a gross sin and just stay in it and never get out. And if he doesn't die the sin and the death, he's on his way to condemnation. But a person who is into these fleshly activities regularly, we shouldn't expect to see them in heaven. Because this is not what believers do. And that is what Paul wants us to understand. People who do these fleshly activities, they're not going to be in the kingdom of heaven.
they're not going to get the inheritance. So there's a warning here too for us as believers to make sure that we don't live our lives in the flesh, that we deny the spirit in our life continuously over a long, long period of time and get into apostasy or, or grow sin and never decide to turn back to Christ. Or we don't respond to the discipline. Now note something else here. And this is something we should spend a moment on because like so many terms in Scripture, they're misused today and or not used properly at all. Many would call the avoidance of the things that's in this list morality. And morality, unfortunately, the definition differs from individual to individual. But most people would consider some things always immoral. Stealing's a big one, murder. But things like fornication and adultery and pornography and similar type of sexual activities uh, by many is not considered immoral or not seriously immoral. Or cheating a little bit here, or telling a white lie, or things like that. You know, it's all kind of been dumbed down to mean something other than what it really means. But morality has its absolute standards. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Or worship idols, and those type of things. People often don't think about the immorality that's behind idolatry. Idolatry is uh, often in the form of greed, the worship of money. Now, you take someone who's moral, and they're unbelievers. There are people who do not murder, of course, and they don't steal. They're honest. They're upright. People call them good old boys or good people or, or those are fine folk and and uh, they use terms like that. And basically, they're not immoral people. They don't run around on their spouses. They raise their kids right. They have a good, hard day at work and come home and relax with their family. And they go to the ball games. They don't watch all the uh, junky TV shows. And people would call them moral. But a good, disciplined, unbeliever can do all those things. He can refuse to let his flesh run amok, as many do. You don't see individuals running around killing everybody they hate or committing adultery with, every, adultery with everybody they want to. But remember, morality does not save a person. It's good to have a moral society But where that can fool people is to think that if they're moral, add some human good, a little religion, and these people think they're saved. And they're not. Because we're only saved based upon the person and work of Christ and through faith in Him and His work. So don't be deceived by this. Now I think most of us as Christians would rather be around people who are moral. I don't care much for the human good type because they want you to join them. And I certainly don't care for the religious type. That's often the worst of the worst. But at the same time, let's remember, we can promote morality, but that doesn't get people saved. That might even clean up the neighborhood, or the town, or the country. But not one more person is saved.
Now, one more time from what our passage tells us. To put the thoughts of inheritance and the flesh and the spirit together. Those who habitually practice these works of the flesh give strong evidence that they are dominated by the flesh. That is the sinful nature and will not see the kingdom of God. Now verse 22 takes us to the opposite side. To the opposite life, we might say. The life of the believer and his production through the Spirit. Let's begin on those and we will spend time on these just like we did the negative side with the works of the flesh. Galatians 5.22 But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. We'll just stop there. We'll start working on these. And again, I want to spend time on these so we can let them get fixed in our minds so we have a good understanding of what should be happening in our lives when we're under the control of the Spirit. Now you may have noticed that the word fruit is in the singular. Uh, it's not saying the fruits of the Spirit. It has a sense of unity here in the way it's being used. The word is karpos. Uh, trees have fruit, obviously. But here it's in a metaphorical usage. It means production, an effect, or a result. Now notice, rather than works, they're called fruit. Quite appropriate. The right term because it's not just something we do. These are products of the Spirit of God through us. It is He who works in our minds and our thoughts and gives us clarification on what we are to do or not do. On the other hand, with the flesh, the works of the flesh, the deeds of the flesh, which we just listed, they come from the body, which is where the flesh is, that is, the sinful nature. Now, you know the makeup. You've seen this enough times now. I think you get the idea that within us we have both the sinful nature and the Holy Spirit. And we choose from our free will which one is going to rule our lives. Here we have our body. And we have our spirit within our body. Let's put our spirit. This is the human spirit, okay? The human spirit. And so you choose to allow the Holy Spirit to run your life and you produce the fruit or you choose to let the sinful nature, let's give this a big S, sinful nature, and you produce the deeds of the flesh, what we just listed. And you are always in a state of one or the other. You're either living off the sin nature, or you're living off the Holy Spirit. Now, when Paul uses the term fruit, he's saying that the Holy Spirit is the originator. He's the author of what's produced. He's the one who's doing this through you. So that's why it's such a good term to use. One of the tangible signs of a disciple of Jesus was to bear fruit. Disciples of Jesus, which should be us, should be bearing fruit. Now the first fruit he mentions is one of the most important. 
In fact, that would be the one that we, I expect most of us would list if we were told you need to list the fruit of the Spirit. And that is the term we've seen many times, agape. It means, or is often translated, love. It means affection or regard. Now this is unmerited love that we have towards others. We don't ask for somebody's favor to show them love. We show love because that's who we are. That's part of our character. There are many of you out there right now who are listening to this that don't know me from, from Adam. But you are getting the Word of God taught to you taught to you and I don't request money I don't require money I don't even ask for money but you are getting you are getting an expression of my love to you don't miss that and don't think this don't cost me it does. And don't think any good Bible teacher doesn't have to make often great sacrifices in ways that many people would not be willing to do. Not only spending years and years in education, but depriving themselves of a lot of things they could have done in other ways, in other professions, and done a lot of things to get more pleasures out of this world. But that's not my goal at all. And not to mention the pressure it puts on one's family and one's wife and one's children when he has to go this route. And I must say, that's what I have to do. This is all I want to do. So at the same time, I may say this is an expression of love to you. It's also my expression and appreciation of a God who has given me so much grace unmerited love and so I pass it on and I hope that you learn to pass it on because that's what disciples do they make more disciples keep in mind when you see the word agape now, I don't know why my pointer is sort of doing double duty here for some reason agape that's unmerited We don't deserve it from God. In fact, what we ought to ask from God is mercy. We ought to ask God for his grace. And he pours out his love in many ways. One of it is that he gives us the spirit, our subject. But this is the type of love that God exhibits towards us even when we were unbelievers. And now, as believers. Let me remind you of a few verses. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Would you die for a horrible sinner? So you might die for a good man. A lot of people do that. But to die for a debauched, decadent, God-hating sinner? See, Christ died for all men, making salvation available to all. This agape love is the great love God has toward us. Ephesians 2.4 Agape love is the love that God poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Romans 5.5 5. John 13.35 says I'll put this one on the board By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Let's look at one more. Let's look at joy. 
The word for joy is kara, often translated gladness. The world often calls this happiness, but this is an inner joy that only the believer can have while, he'll li while living in the power of the Spirit. Don't forget that. Only the believer in the power of the Spirit can live, can have this joy. Now there is no reason for a believer to be down or depressed for very long. And we do all get that way, I suppose, I know I have. You get discouraged, you get down. But you don't stay down long. And if it's because of sin, you confess your sin, you give yourself back to the Spirit of God, you walk in the Spirit, and you will begin to experience your joy again. Now this is not the glad, happy, jumping around in the air type. Though you may have that now and then. But this is a what I call a basic joy. A satisfaction about life. A way of understanding what's going on around you and about yourself and your place in God's plan and how he's using you. And that is a great joy. And if you are not on your path to serve God fully, you will not experience the extent of joy that you have coming to you. It's unique to a spirit-controlled Christian growing in the Lord. Now listen, this is not a joy dependent on circumstances. It's a joy depending on the power of the Spirit. Let me give you some side results. You will enjoy in-depth Bible study because you're controlled by the Spirit and you'll have a pleasure resulting from learning the deep things of God. And even more so when you go out there in the world and you apply them and you see God work in your life, you see God work in circumstances, and in the most difficult of circumstances, you can have joy. And after you've done this a while, you can understand James 1, 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Then James goes on to teach why. If you haven't studied the James series, you should. That's one of those series I want to do early because it's simple, it's practical, and everybody needs it. In Philippians 1.25, Paul writes, There is joy in the faith. 1 Thessalonians 1.6, this will be our final verse. You became imitators of us and of the Lord in spite of severe suffering. You welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. Who? By the Holy Spirit. They welcomed the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit. And when I look at some of the uh, listeners and what they do with some of the recordings, they listen to them for a few seconds and then they just turn them off because it's not what they wanted. Boy, are they missing the joy. This is God-given stuff. And by that I mean I dug and in the power of the Spirit I dug and I did my best to come up with the truth for you listeners. And when you're in control of the Spirit and you're in the power of the Spirit as you learn these things, you too will experience the joy of the message. And you'll welcome the Word of God. And there will be a time in your life if you keep this up where you can't wait to get to your Bible study. What are you doing in there, dear? Studying. The Bible? Yes. Well, We'll stop here and continue on with the list of the fruit of the Spirit next time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. 
as we experience the joy of your truth in our hearts and minds, we ask that we might also apply these things, that we'll have the discernment we need in this world to live the life of Christ in the power of the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.